The views expressed on this show by guests and the host on issues outside of the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence are the opinions of those individuals alone and do not necessarily reflect those of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of 9-11 Freefall. I'm the host, Andy Steele, and this is going to be a treat today. We're going to be bringing on one of my own personal heroes here in the 9-11 Truth Movement. He's actually one of the first people that I ever saw talking about this subject. Uh, his film right there behind me, The Great Conspiracy, was something that I passed around a lot back in the early days, really opened my eyes, not just to 9-11 truth, but some of the deceptions that have gone on in the world before, like the whole uh, Kuwaiti incubator baby lie uh, that was used to send us into the Gulf War back in the 90s. We may get into some of that stuff today, but uh, this person is Barry Zwicker. Barry is an author, producer, and social and political activist specializing in media criticism since 1970. Since the events of 9-11, he's become a leader in the 9-11 Truth Movement. He authored uh, a book called Towers of Deception, the Media Cover-Up of 9-11, which won gold in the current events category of the 2007 Independent Publisher Awards. Uh, prior to 1970, he was an award-winning newspaper writer for the Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, and the Detroit News, among others. His commentary, Facing the Fourth Estate, was aired weekly on 18 CBC stations. He taught journalism for seven years at Ryerson University and worked for 15 years at Vision TV, finishing with his own weekly program called Media File. Uh, and then in March 2002, he produced the 44-minute video, The Great Deception. And in the fall of 2004, the DVD, The Great Conspiracy, the 9-11 news special you never saw. He's been prol prolific, folks, and it's an honor to have him on the show today. So let's bring him on in. Barry, welcome back to 9-11 Freefall. Gosh, did I do all those things? I've forgotten about them. <laughs> well, you got to keep moving forward. That is how you produce a lot of work and have a very rich life. And I know you have. Well, I'm still cooking with uh, maybe not gas, but something, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So this is the first time you've ever been on the video show. It's like a reboot of 9-11 Freefall ever since we went to... Uh, video, which requires me to comb my hair and all that stuff before I get on here. Uh, yeah. But I think it's good for this audience. It's where things have gone. Uh, but because of that, uh, we may have new viewers, new people uh, who uh, didn't uh, aren't familiar with you yet. Tell us more about your career and how you woke up to the false flag inside job of September 11th. Yeah, well, listen, uh, Andy, we, feel free to cut me off, too, because I could go on too long about something and then uh, not leave time for me to discuss something else. But it's my I, job I, easier I, the I'm more thinking you about that question because you, you said that would just be one question about how did I get involved with 9-11. And as far as uh, I, I think that because I'm writing my memoir, and, uh, you know, you're casting back and wondering even what were childhood um, influences. And people's childhoods are very important. And so the thing is, my father was a United Church minister. That's a, that's a Protestant um, denomination, very small, liberal in Canada. And so he was completely opposed, for instance, to Hitler when he, my father, was preaching in Cape Breton, on Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia in the 1930s. And my father got into trouble with the church board for getting political in the pulpit and preaching against Hitler. Can you believe it? He, mm -hmm. uh, that, that actually happened. I have his diaries. So anyway, uh, I learned uh, as soon as I was introduced to the subject of the Reichstag fire, of 1933, which was the year before I was born, that actually Hitler arranged for the Reichstag, the German parliament to be burned. And that gave him 
uh, chance to round up all the socialists and communists, put them in jail or worse. So, so I already knew about a huge false flag operation pretty well all my life from the time I was an early teenager. Uh, so I was primed, if you will, to understand that huge deceptions are carried out. And as I went to college and so on, I ran into them. Uh, and, and then I saw more and more of them, especially emanating from the American empire. You know, the, the Gulf of Tonkin deception. And obviously I could go on and on about the deceptions. And, and so when 9-11 happened, the specific day, and of course we all have a kind of a flashbulb moment if we were alive at that time, which I happened to be, uh, a, a flashbulb moment about something important. So I was at home, my wife and I were at home and my wife came to me and she said, the neighbors, because she'd been talking across the back fence with neighbors, said there's something interesting going on in New York City. You might be interested in tuning in on it. So, of course, I go to the TV, and there's my wife and I, and, and uh, one of, uh, we had a basement apartment, and uh, the male side of the, of the tenants in the basement, Ken Carnero, there were the three of us watching. And at first, I thought, because I have a great interest, too, in aviation. That was another thing that allowed me to twig early, I see, in retrospect. And so I'm jumping up and down in front of the coach saying, come on, U.S. Air Force, let's get going, U.S. Air Force, because I knew that they scramble in minutes when there's a big emergency. And before around 11 o'clock that morning, I thought, wait a minute, this is impossible. It's impossible that the U.S. Air Force hasn't shown up. And by noon, I said, and of course, I had the uh, witnesses, my wife and, and the tenant, Ken. I said, this is a rice egg fire, 2001. And because, so, and, and you know, there, there are uh, logical reasons uh, two that enter in, because if you are uh, involved with something like, uh, let's say you're a, a fire uh, guard in a forestry, in forestry, that's your job. And then you meet, meet somebody and you say, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a forest fire watcher. And the person you're talking to says, oh yeah, I am too. And then you ask that person a couple of questions and they can't answer them. That's all you need. It's called one thin slice to know that that person is not on the level. And, and with 9-11, there wasn't just one thin slice. It was slice after slice and big fat ones too. So that's how, that's how come on, on the day of 9-11, I got wise to it. And then I, I went ahead and I am proud. I am proud that I was the first journalist in the world on a national TV, on national TV, uh, to seriously question uh, the official story of 9-11. I, I did six of my weekly commentaries on Vision TV about it. And I'm also, I, and I'd almost forgotten about this too, and I've got to look up, look, look it up. Uh, the, the, the mail and the phone calls that Vision TV got, because I was in my 12th year there, so I had my own show, as the intro said, media file. And they had the greatest uh, feedback that they'd ever had in the channel's history. And the channel opened in September 88. So it showed there were all sorts of other people like me who had questions. But uh, of course then the, the repetition, the constant repetition, billions of times of the official story just kind of does a, does a job on, our, on, on, the, on the general public's uh, mentality. And, and I'm just glad that there still is a 9-11 truth movement. I still support it, 
but currently these days, as you mentioned in your intro, intro I think, uh, I'm focusing on, on a memoir that will be more personal than political. That's it. Yeah, you know, it takes a lot of courage back then even more so than now, because people are sort of used to there being a group out there talking about this now. But back in the early days, to say that, you know, the government may have had something to do with 9-11 or been lied to about it, you know, was sacrilegious uh, in the America, in the here in the United States, but in the rest of the Western world as well, to sit there and question these events and then to go out on TV and be one of the people hitting the barbed wire on this took a lot of guts. And that is an important thing because uh, somebody has to speak out and then the floodgates open. And it's funny because you watch the mainstream media coverage of our movement and they make it sound like it's just a small group of fringe people living in their mother's basements, uh, you know, <laughs> like, uh, and that there isn't any general interest in what we have to say unless you're crazy. But when something actually comes loose, comes out onto the mainstream media about this, they get all sorts of views behind it. I've seen this in so many different instances, so many different examples of this, and people get really engaged. So there is a big uh, audience out there, even if it's not people like us who are involved in it all the time. When it comes up, people want to know more and people have those internal suspicions. Yeah. Uh, I noticed the world change. Now, I'm, you know, I was only in my early 20s when 9-11 happened. I hadn't had a lot of world life uh, experience uh, before then, but I did notice my own changes in society uh, that disturbed me. What, in your view, having experienced society longer was the most disturbing change in the world that you witnessed after 9-11? Well, I, I don't really think that there was a disturbing change in the world. I remember doing uh, one of my commentaries, and, and the point of it was I found better words than I'm finding these days right now uh, to express myself. But but I, I believe that, that the title of my commentary was something like this, that I'm reading in all the papers that 9-11 has changed everything. And my commentary was, no, it hasn't changed everything. The U.S. empire is just doing what the U.S. empire does. That was the drip. So I guess probably I was going against the grain when I said that too. And I had to emphasize in that, I'm recalling it now, that I was not anti-American. I mean, I worked in the States, I studied in the States, relatives in the States, and friends in the States, so that this is no way is this anti-Americanism, but this is solidarity with Americans who are critical of their own country insofar as it acts like a nasty empire, you know, uh, People like the dear departed David Ray Griffin. Yeah. But now another thing that I might mention, uh, which picks up on, on what you've asked me about big changes, is that I don't see necessarily that the Hamas attack of October the, uh, of, of October the 5th, uh, or 7th, was it? Yeah, the 7th. Uh, that that either is a big change. Now, I realize it was the greatest attack on Israel that they had uh, suffered in decades. But there's a similarity, and we're still with 9-11 here. There are similarities and dissimilarities between 9-11 and the Hamas attack, which has yet to be qu queried seriously anywhere. OK, so I think there's a justification. I'll go on a limb on this, that there's a parallel between 9-11 and October the 7th. And the parallel lies in what a wise 9-11 truther, an American, and I can't remember who it was, Andy. Maybe you'll be, remember, be able to remember who this was, who said they either made it happen or they let it happen. And if they let it happen, they made it happen. Do you remember that? 
I don't remember who said it, but I, I'm familiar with the my hop and lie hop terminology. Yeah. And there's always been a debate in the 9-11 truth movement. I remember when I first started waking up to this, some radio show hosted a panel with people from varying degrees of support or lack of support for our position. One guy with the lie hop position, one guy with the my hop, and then you have debunkers on either side. And uh, so there's even debate you know, or there was debate uh, within our our movement about, you know, the, the the level of U.S. government involvement. Of course, here at 1811 Truth, we don't come out and say, oh, the government did it. We just stick to the science. But I don't know how Osama bin Laden would get explosives into the World Trade Center towers. Um, so, you know, do that with what you will. Uh, but yeah. please, please continue. I'm not. I don't know who actually said that exact quote. Though. Yeah, and it, I, I, I remember it was a particular guy, and it stuck in my mind. And I thought it just summarized so well. They either made it happen or they let it happen. And if they let it happen, they made it happen. Because there's different, different categories of false flag op. Really, you know, you could say the Gulf of Tonkin uh, was a false flag op, it involved a, a major lie about something that never happened and started a war. What were there two congresspersons, Senator Wayne Morse and another one who voted against that war declaration. And then there's millions of lives later. And this, uh, and this American destroyer, the Maddox, never was. Uh, and even Ben Bradley uh, uh, wrote about that, that, that the Maddox was never attacked by a North uh, Vietnamese torpedo boat. But anyway, so coming back then to October the 7th, Mossad is a legendary intelligence agency. And now their uh, Mossad's uh, motto is without deception, a nation falls. And the former motto of Mossad was, by way of deception, thou shalt do war. And there were other, there, there were two or three other mottos Ma Mossad had along the way. But Mossad is second only to the CIA in size and capability and deceptiveness. And, and so the, with, with all the, with all the spies they have, all the agents they have, certainly in the Arab countries as well as elsewhere. And within the Palestinian communities, yes, they have their agents. And so, but here, I don't have to just go on my own suppositions, my own theories, my own hypotheses. It was published in the New York Times, you might have seen this, December the 1st, 2023, Jerusalem Dateline by Julia Frankel. If you now the, the lead of the story is Israel's military was aware of Hamas's plan to launch an attack on Israeli soil over a year before the devastating October 7 operation that killed hundreds of people. And that was in the New York Times that day. And her story goes on. It was the latest in a series of signs that top Israeli commanders either ignored or played down warnings that Hamas was plotting the attack, which then triggered the war. And the, the war was, we, history is yet to be written. I, I'm not going to try to predict the future, but it really helped Netanyahu to begin with because he was in trouble with the public. Yep. There are thousands of people demonstrating night after night. And by the way, something I learned from an Israeli pollster, those thousands of people who are demonstrating against Netanyahu and his right-wing, increasingly right-wing government, when they were polled, and this really disappointed me. I mean, this was news to me, and I wasn't happy to hear it. But when they polled these from among these people, these thousands of demonstrators, almost none of them said that what that one thing that concerned them about the Netanyahu regime was the treatment of Palestinians. 
that was not what they were in uh, they that's not why they were on the streets they were on the streets because netanyahu was going gangbusters to be a dictator and trying to do away with the israeli supreme court which was the only counterbalancing force in that country and still is thank goodness so so anyway with all their spies my god they had to know i mean but I, then i was pleased if that's the right word to read the new york times reporting this and so they they knew and and what, what tipped me off about it actually was more like was more like the reason i got tipped off uh, on 9 11 like where was the u.s air force how come right there at the gaza boundary there were not a bunch of Israeli soldiers and so forth, so forth. They that was hours before they showed up, uh, and that just struck me as, as the equivalent of the U.S. Air Force failing to show up, and and I, I think I, I'll make a bit of a risky prediction that somehow when history records it, probably after I'm gone, it'll turn out that there'll be chapter and verse that whether Netanyahu, Netanyahu himself knew uh, there are ways of doing these things at the highest levels and mm -hmm. things when you say, don't tell me, I don't want to know. But there were certain people, certainly uh, according to this New York Times story that, that first of all, the Israeli military declined to comment on this report that Israeli officials were in possession of a 40 page battle plan by Hamas, codenamed Jericho Wall, that detailed a hypothetical Hamas attack on Southern Israeli committees, 40 pages. Now, whether Netanyahu saw it or not, I don't know, but I tend to think that there probably was such a report. And the story goes on and on here. Uh, the October 7th attack, this New York Times story says, which 1,200 people were killed uh, and 240 people abducted and taken to Gaza, would uncannily mirror the one outlined in the battle plan. So not only, I would dare to say right now, did the Netanyahu government and military and Mossad know that there was going to be an attack, but they knew where. And it was only a matter of when, and I can't believe that they didn't know when. Because even in conventional media reports here in Canada <clears throat> and elsewhere, is Israeli commentators were saying out loud that it takes months and months to plan an attack like this. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. If it takes months and months to plan it, and they've got spies everywhere. How could they not know about it? So I, I you know, uh, I, it's it's. The, in other words, the attack was planned in plain sight, and and it's and it's been in in a horrible way, a plus for the Zionists uh, that have so s stolen so much land, maltreated to say the least, so many Palestinians for so long. And, and it, it, it is a Zionist wet dream that they would be able to wreak the horror in Gaza that they have. And, you know, I was talking a moment ago about flashbulb moments, things that stick out at you. Like, I, I remember with the Vietnam War, one of the one of the pictures that stuck in my mind right to this day was a picture of a Viet Cong, I guess, or somebody uh, who was suspected of of being uh, in the Viet Cong. And here was the police chief of Saigon, and the gun was like that, and he blew his brains out. That picture mm -hmm. ran on front pages. And then there was the young girl running naked toward the camera burned with napalm you can't forget these things you know and so when it comes to the i i there were whole nights i couldn't even bear to watch the news about gaza 
It was just too horrible to watch. But I remember one night where there was this huge building and I only saw this clip once, once, a great big building. And then there's a gigantic explosion and the whole building is destroyed in one gigantic explosion. And you know what the building was? A university. Hmm. I'm never ever gonna forgive that. Like there's certain things I can't forgive. I know you're supposed to be forgivable, forgivable. Uh, are you able to express forgiveness when you get as old as I am? But there's some things that are really, really hard to forgive. And blowing up a whole university at one gigantic bomb is is really not forgivable in my in my books. Anyway, uh, I, I there's there's my hypothesis that that October seventh with a false flag up of the let them do it type. No, I've seen a lot of stuff myself. And, you know, I mean, it's kind of the point when you wake up to 9-11 and this is part of my goal and continuously talking about the World Trade Center evidence is that you really cement it in people's minds that, hey, they lied about this really big thing. You know, you should second guess what you're hearing from the TV news and from your government when other things inevitably come up. And so if I accomplish nothing else with this show and all of this work, hopefully someday <clears throat> when something else happens, a young person who may be following this will question. And maybe that person becomes a congressman. Maybe they're the ones that changed the world. And you plant those seeds and they sprout later. Uh, yeah. But, you know, listen, you talk about how they've got spies everywhere. And, you know, I mean, the first thing that I would say if I was an Israeli citizen, even if I believed uh, my government's uh, story about this is what am I paying for then? You know, you have these increasingly intrusive security measures happening. It's like when somebody was talking to me about the, the Pentagon on September 11th and, you know, the, the fact that there's not really any clear footage of what happened there that day. And, you know, I was pointing this out and they said, well, maybe there's something about our defenses that uh, they don't want us to see, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, defense of the building that uh, triggered that, you know, they don't want us to, to reveal to us. And I said, well, obviously it didn't work if you believe the official story. Right. So why not release it and, and uh, let the people see exactly uh, what went on there that day? Uh, so we get these increasingly intrusive measures being put upon us, increasingly expensive for this military industrial complex. And then at the critical moment, supposedly, they do not work. It's almost like reminds me of before September 11th. Uh, Bin Laden was this wanted man responsible supposedly for these bombings in these different countries and such, number one enemy of America. You've got the full resources of the U.S. government and European governments and probably Israeli, I assume, governments looking for this guy. And, uh, you know, the United States was no slouch when it came to that stuff, you know, the deep state and all of its resources there. Um, and they supposedly can't find this guy, but CNN and somehow marches in and interviews him. Yeah, and prior to September 11th. So, yeah. you know, CNN can find them. And, you know, it's not America's best and brightest over there at CNN. All right. When you watch when you watch these people, but they, you know, they find him and, and you know, they, they leave him alone afterwards. And he supposedly carries out this attack. And then you know, Osama bin Laden's face is flashed all over the news on and after September 11th, the big boogeyman. And in only a short time. The attention goes to Iraq, and I don't know how long after 9-11 this happened, but George Bush, President George Bush, was asked about uh, bin Laden while he was talking about Saddam Hussein, and he was like, oh, you know, I don't think about him much anymore. Yeah. You know, almost like, oh, uh, this guy who supposedly ac you know, actually did some damage here to the United States, you're not thinking about him at all. And then I'm just going through the history here because this is just all so bizarre. Obama comes into office, pacifies a lot of the, the left people that were protesting Bush. Um, and it's almost like an afterthought. They have this operation that kills Osama bin Laden. And right there on the boat coming back, they bury bin Laden at sea. And they yeah. say it's in line with Muslim traditions. I don't pretend to be some expert on Muslim traditions, but I've never heard of that one before. You know, they make it sound like bin Laden suddenly is a pirate, you know. And they have to toss the body in the ocean before there's any kind of independent verification. 
And then I think it was the AP, either the AP or Reuters, one of those agencies, uh, sued the Obama administration to get some kind of photos of bin Laden's body just to show that the deed was done. And uh, the Obama administration fought it tooth and nail. They didn't want to release anything. Yeah. And I don't think it was ever released. So, And it, it was so ridiculous that on the night of the supposed bin Laden kill, because I was watching it like a hawk, this ABC news lady, when that report came in that bin Laden had been buried at sea, you could see the doubt cross her face, but she's got to stay in character for the deep state here. And she just made a comment like, oh, the conspiracy theorists are going to have a field day with that one. But you could see it on her face that she wasn't buying it either, but she ain't going to say anything. So it's like, yeah, you know, again, we, we have to pay for this deep state. Your dollar is losing value by the day here um, for all of this stuff. Yet at the critical moments, supposedly they always fail us. Um, I don't buy it. Well, you know, there's there's it is possible to, to theorize a bit, and I am emphasizing theorizing. Uh, the people who populate the CIA and Mossad and, 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 and other like organizations in other countries and so on, they, they, they are following the Mossad model by way of deception. And there's one thing I, I'll just, as a bit of an aside, not exactly an aside. I wish, and I've done what I can, and I'll continue to do what I can, to alert people to the whole phenomenon of false flag operations, the whole phenomenon of big deceptions, and how they just wreck carnage on whole countries and whole peoples and they keep getting away with it it's the total opposite of transparency now if you were an evil genius and there are lots of evil geniuses in the likes of the cia and mossad and they all have their propaganda departments and 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 there's psychologists working there and i think those psycholo psychologists have to be a bit bent to even go and work for the cia you know because it's it's not a transparent outfit and it engages in assassinations and overturning governments so why would a self-respecting academic or professional psychologist go and work for that but you can always find people who will now then let us say they want to run a beta test to find out how gullible can the public be. And it'll be a really clever beta test because it'll be on a particular subject, particular people involved, particular political angles to it and what have you. And then they could launch a false flag operation, which would be, we're doing something here that is so stupid that everybody should be able to see it right away. Let's find out how many ne people nevertheless, mainly thanks to the media that don't ask nearly, nearly enough questions, never have. Find out how many people catch on and become a political force. And so, you know, it could, they, <laughs> I, I mean, the, the, any, they'll do anything actually that, covers it. They will do anything. They will lie. They will kill. They will torture. Uh, and these uh, govern these these arms companies, for instance, they're willing to make huge bundles of money conducting wars right when planet Earth is in really increasing danger existentially from global burning and boiling. I don't call it global warming anymore. Global burning and boiling. And so how can they in conscience be busy every day in their offices and in their warehouses and in their assembly lines making bombs and bullets and tanks and fighter planes and everything when, when th that's the very, very last kinds of things that the planet earth and its people need right now. They have to be morally insane 
That's how I put it. And and uh, but they're they're still in charge. I mean the the uh, you know the USA uh, has the largest so-called defense budget. There's language being absurdly uh, mishandled to call these arms companies defense contractors. They're contractors that build all manner of killing machines and killing supplies. And, and uh, so I've told, I, I, since I sold my house, I came into a bit of money and I said to my financial advisor, none of my money should be ever invested in arms companies or fossil fuel companies. And my financial advisor said, you know what, more and more of our clients are saying that. But there are loads of people who have no trouble profiting from uh, the, the, the production of bombs and tanks and planes and the deployment of them. And, and, and I have various American friends who are totally pissed off with Biden. You know, allowing, for instance, no congressional oversight about the last uh, few uh, shipments of bombs and so forth to Israel, and and the money still going to Israel. I mean, it's it's just beyond belief. And so, but whether Trump would be better, I that's just beyond my comprehension. I have no idea. I doubt it. But uh, it's it's a sad and dangerous world and getting sadder and more dangerous really by the day. And um, I can't help being angry about this. And, uh, and, and I, what can we do? Well, one thing, by the way, I found out this past Tuesday <clears throat> that I could do because I was, I've been sick at heart about what's going on in Gaza. And of course, a lot of bad shit is going down in the West Bank, too. A lot of settler, settlers killing a lot of Palestinians. Of course, this has been going on since 1948, so on. Few of us know this sort of stuff. The war didn't start in October of last year. The war against Palestinians and the destruction of their land and, and, and so forth. But it, it's uh, just a, a matter of having to wake up people and I was feeling very frustrated. I wrote my member of parliament. Uh, I wrote letters to the editor about these things. The letters didn't get published. I write a pretty good letter to the editor, but they only have room for so many. And uh, so I, I uh, signed up to be on the mailing list for the United Nations. And last Tuesday, I found out you can actually give money to the uh, UNRWA, the, the United Nations aid agency, the one that has the 13,000 employees in Gaza. And last Tuesday, I sent $500 to a man, Jordan, to the headquarters of that agency. And that, so I thought, no, I could do something. Then after I did that, I, I emailed about 30 friends and relatives and just said gently, this is what I discovered can be done. We don't have to just be sick at heart. We can actually send money to help Palestinians directly. Now, it was beyond ironic that the very Tuesday that I had that I had the money sent to a man Jordan to help the Palestinians was the day that they announced they can't go in to Rafa anymore. It's too dangerous. There's too much chaos, and the World Food Plan, uh, that's the WFP of the UN, they can't deliver the food that I sent money to help provide for starving. Palestinians, but I'm satisfied that they'll find a way. So I'm glad I sent it. And I hope that people I know that I notified, you can actually, you don't have to sit back and do zero except cry. 
you can actually send money. And this is where I'm so pissed off with the Canadian government and the nine or 10 other governments that rapidly cut off the aid to, to, to that agency just days or hours practically after Israel claimed without evidence that there were a dozen members, dozen employees out of 13,000 in Gaza that had been in cahoots with Hamas. Now, whether that's true or not, it's a tiny, tiny percentage. But immediately, 10 governments, United States being the leading one, but also Switzerland, Germany, the Netherlands, Canada to, to the shame, and I sent a letter to our prime minister about this, you know, saying that, that without due diligence, you accepted a claim and you're and you're and you're cutting the money off from a united nations food agency for god's sake who would do that you know a six-year-old child would not do that kind of horrible thing and and uh but anyway i've i've given the 500 bucks i think i'll send more i mean i could spare another 500 and and uh if anybody who's listening to this rant uh, wants to go. It's really easy to, you know, you just go to the United Nations website, bang, you're, you get right there, you get right into it. And, and, and there's ways to safely give your money. Now, my credit card company phoned me and said, is this legitimate? I said, yes, it absolutely is. And, that, and they said, okay, and it's gone through. But, you know, all there are various ways that the good intentions can be can be uh, diverted. And uh, so that's something to watch out about. If any listener decides to send the United Nations money to help feed starving Palestinians, uh, watch out that your credit card company doesn't think it's a scam. The scam, all in caps, is much higher, much bigger, much worse than anything you can imagine happening to your 500 bucks. Yeah, I know people that have run into those kind of issues trying to do uh, work with Palestinian charities and stuff, and the bank calls them and says, uh, you know, is this, is this for real? And they ask them a bunch of questions. Um, you know, as I get older, I'm, I'm seeing the issues in this world when you boil it down as more than just like, oh, if we follow this kind of ism or if we follow this politician or whatever, we can fix things. I think what we are seeing is a very human problem. And if you step back from the grant, you know, to, to the look at it on a more grand level away from just the, the little minute snapshot of life that we experience in our lives, there's a change happening. And I think ultimately, maybe after I'm gone from this world, it'll, if we don't blow ourselves up, uh, it, it will go, it'll be a good change. But we, like, for instance, the internet, all right, you know, back in the 80s, we didn't really have the internet available to regular people. So, you know, if you knew, if you knew somebody from another country, it was a very novel thing. I remember there was a family from England that moved to my town. It was like, a, like, wow. Somebody's from another country here in this town. They were very well known and popular because it was not something you encountered very often. Now you can have friends on the other side of the world. It's not that big of a thing. And so when you know people on the other side of the world, you know, maybe you're a guy and you pick up a girlfriend from, um, you know, uh, from Syria or something, yeah. um, you know, and then your country is bombing them the next day. You're going to get upset about that. It influences how you think, because once you get to know people from the other side of the world, uh, what you're going to learn is that people are pretty much people no matter where you go. Yes, there's going to be some different cultural things. Yeah. Some some people will be more conservative in uh, how they act than others. But generally, the same kind of archetypes that we see in our society exist everywhere else. There's really good people. There's some real jerks. Um, and there's some real clowns. And, you know, that that's, uh, but you know, it, it's pretty much the same. And so, what it does is it humanizes the rest of the world. Now, I think if the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us about switched over to trying to 
increase our communication and increase our ability to travel, you know, work on civilian space flight. If you could tell your girlfriend, hey, honey, let's go to Paris for the weekend. We'll get on the, the supersonic uh, space jet on <laughs> Friday and then we'll land, you know, spend a weekend and then come back for work on, you know, on Sunday night so we can be at work on Monday morning. That would change everything. It would change uh, people's ability to interact with people in other in other countries. Like, oh, I want to go see the Holy Land. Uh, say so you're a really religious person. Let's go up for a few days or a day or so and check out that thing and scoop back. Um, people would be more interconnected. They would not think about their national boundaries so much. They would think about other people as, as people. And ultimately, I think it would be good. I know there's people in the conspiracy movement who are like, who are like we, we you know we can't have a world government well the problem is we can't have a world government under the current leadership because this is an old guard that is not adapting to the way technology is is uh making our society go and because they they don't know how to adapt to it without losing control and losing power over their own personal influences that's why we're seeing all of these horrible violent things and false flags and wars and such. And ultimately they are going to lose if they don't blow up the planet in the process. I mean, they're going to lose either way. The question is, are they going to take the rest of us with them yeah. uh, in this? But if I was president and I would never do that to myself, but uh, you know, this would, this would be the first step towards trying to get us off of this system, this money flowing on a river of blood for these big interests is all right, well, you know, I would like to see the leadership of them change, but there's lots of people that work for these companies switch over to something like civilian space flight, switch over. I mean, that would have such a huge impact on shipping, on our industry. You can get products across the globe uh, in, in record time. And I think that it would be better off. But what we're seeing, this is my belief that we're seeing the pains of a world that's changing and the old guard desperately trying to hold on to the way things were. And that's why we're seeing all of this ugliness, 9-11 uh, included. I don't know. What do you think about my rant? Well, it's, it's a rant that I, I agree with. And, and, you know, it could be that you could say that Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell, the great British philosopher and activist and scientist and historian and author, my main hero, uh, that that they had a line in a 1955 declaration that they released, which was, remember your humanity and forget the rest. Just that one line, remember your humanity and forget the rest. And, and uh so and now speaking of humanity, I, I've got a little rant of my own that involves language, and you know how important language is. I'm gonna hold up a clipping. That this is what I wrote a letter to the editor about this. Here uh, make okay, here is the article Crying for Jews, Canada, Humanity. This is written by a Jewish businessman in Toronto. So in this, I read this, and then I counted certain words in it. And again, how important language is. The words human and humanity appear four times in this article. The words Canada or Canadian appear 21 times in this article. The words Jews and Jewish appear 22 times in this article. How many times do the words Palestine or Palestinians appear in this article that's allegedly all about humanity? You know the answer, zero times. And, I, you know, I did media criticism for years. I can't, I can't help it. But this kind of thing is shows us that we need to be careful about our language too and there's there's uh various uh phrases like defense industries you know i just i just can't go along with with the department of defense 
right? Because mm -hmm. it's it, these are departments of war, and they used to call them the Department yeah, of War they did. at one time, you know, uh, and and uh, so. Um, there's another there is another phrase. I'm actually looking in my notes to see if I can find it. Oh, oh, well, I've run across something else in my notes that possibly uh, possibly viewers don't know. And I found out about this. A friend of mine has written this book called I Was a Catholic Zionist. And he grew up in Toronto. Uh, in a part of Toronto that is very heavily Jewish, and he really did have a lot of Jewish friends. Ted Schmidt told us at that meeting about the number of politicians, especially in the, especially in the right wing Israeli government, uh, use family names that got changed. He named about twenty of them. The, these were families that that had names that weren't Hebra who Hebraic, Hebraic, right? Didn't, weren't founded in the Hebrew language and history of the Hebrews. And they have changed their names so that they will be really good Zionists who will be seen, who are connected by generations to the early Jews in the land of Judea, right? That's what they want to be seen as. And he named about 20 of them. And you can guess who one of them is, Netanyahu. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, Netanyahu's paternal grandfather was named Nathan Miliakowski. M I L E I K O W S K Y. He was a rabbi and a Zionist writer. So when Netanyahu's father emigrated to what they called Mandatory Palestine, which under the British, they really cleared the way for colonialism there and for the Palestinian people to be ground down and worse. That Netanyahu's father, they call it. Hebraized, H-E-B-R-A-I-Z-E-D. -E he Hebraized his surname from Miliakowski to Netanyahu. And you know hmm. what Netanyahu means in no Hebrew? Idea. What? God has given. Hmm. God has given us Netanyahu. Well, that's a pretty mean God. <laughs> you know? So, well, so God gives us everyone. <laughs> yeah. You know? and, and anyway, an, another another uh, phrase, if I can just stay with language again, because it's so important, is ethnic cleansing. Over and over, I'm reading in the media that there's ethnic cleansing going on with Palestinians in the West Bank, for instance. And I ask anybody. What do you think of what is connotated when you hear the word ethnic cleansing, the phrase ethnic cleansing? Well, first of all, there's the word ethnic. So what do you think of? You probably think of a choir of young, pretty girls dressed in blouses that, are, that have embroidery on them, dancing and singing. You know, that's where the word ethnic usually shows up. Uh, and then think of cleaning. What do you think of? You think of a TV commercial where there's a beautiful woman smelling her laundry and saying, oh, the perfume of this detergent is so beautiful. Mm, my bed clothes are fresh. That's ethnic cleansing. Those are the two words that go into that phrase of ethnic cleansing. The word should be violent betrayal and murder and torture. Why, why ethnic cleansing? I mean, I'm sorry that this these misuses of language really get to me, as you can tell, and I get into a rant. So that I thank you for letting me uh, rant about that. If anybody says ethnic cleaning, cleansing, in, in my hearing, they catch it from me. 
I, I practically get violent. Well, you know, Edward Bernays used to advise the U.S. government during World War I on how to sell that entire idea, making the world safe for democracy. That's what we're doing. We're not uh, countering Germans' empire with our own. And, and of course, the Germans were blamed for bayoneting babies. And it's that always was babies. Never, that, that did not actually happen, hardly at all, if at all. And that's what the Israelis have come up with about about babies being being bayoneted and women being raped and burned. And and it turns out already, if you read Consortium News and some other excellent sources that I support with my dollars too, that that a lot of a lot of what's been reported about the attack by Hamas has not been accurate. Let's put it that way. There were a lot of people hurt and 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 there's been eyewitness testimony about this by the is what happened by the uh hands of the israeli military in that part of israel there was a whole house blown up by the israel uh forces because they thought there was Hamas in it, but what was in that house was a bunch of Israelis, and they blew it up. I mean, they're really, really good at blowing stuff up. It's just something else to see. Universities, houses, people. Uh, I, I mean, it. it and and I, I'm not going to forgive the Canadian government until they restore the funding for the UNRWA, um, whereas they just withdrew it prematurely uh, with, with, with no proper consideration or due diligence. So, and, and there's three cabinet ministers in, in Canada who are responsible for that. And I just sent off a letter to them today. You know, not that I even hear, you know, they don't even acknowledge letters anymore. When you write your MP, you don't necessarily even get an acknowledgement. There's a it's digital wall in front of everything. They don't yeah. even bother. And it's like, I, you know, at some point we're going to have an AI Congress in this country. This is my prediction. I'm going to predict the future. It might not happen uh, in the next 10 years or whatever, but someday they're going to, you know, you want to talk to your congressman, you're going to have to call an AI bot that'll just kind of filter through what you say and maybe deliver a memo or just resolve it. I mean, this is the way things are going. You can't even get a human when you're trying, you got a problem with your vacuum cleaner or something anymore. That's, I know it's getting harder and harder to get a human being on the other end of the line. I'm ama I'm amazed that 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 we're able to talk like human beings here, uh, but you know, with the deception that goes on, maybe it turns out we're fake. <laughs> we're just maybe. AI manipulated creatures. I mean, that's coming on fast, isn't it? It's oh, it really is. coming on oh, fast. That uh, is a whole other subject. It is. It is. Yeah. You know, well, I, I'm I'm sorry. I'm, sorry, I mentioned it. Well, no, but I mean, I, I like someday, yeah, you might have an AI president where it's like every four years they're like, okay, what flavor do you want? They'll pull the Americans and it's like, okay, maybe, uh, you know, this uh, this kind of race, this kind of gender, we'll put it in there, uh, this, this tone of voice, how attractive do you want it? And it'll be the same agenda. It'll just kind of fizzle out and, and take on a new human-like form. But I mean, that's basically what we have now with the real people. I mean, Joe Biden, are you kidding me? This guy, I mean... The guy, I, like, you can't even, like, it, it's such a level of disdain that I have for this guy that I don't even have disdain. It's almost like, okay, we just don't have a president right now. We're all on our own. We're up against a faceless system. That's how I think about it. But, you know, when you realize that this entire world is run on BS, you know, it's yeah. so liberating. I mean, that, that is it. So many millions of dollars and so many lives and so many agendas based on a river of BS that um, it's liberating, but some of that BS is dangerous and can yeah. come home to us. You know, for the first time ever, I'm actually really worried about a nuclear war breaking out uh, over what's going on in the Ukraine. Uh, so, and we, not we cover out of the it. Question. Not out and, of the question. And think of all the peace marches that I marched in. I'll tell you, I know we're running out of our hour here, but this is just a little recollection. When you're writing your memoirs, you get these little recollections. During the Vietnam War, I was in one of the many marches, and my wife and kids were with me. Uh, and I, I, we're going down University Avenue, 
in Toronto protesting the Vietnam War and we're passing the US Embassy, right? And I was holding up a homemade sign that I made. And it wasn't that big, uh, but it had capital N, capital A, capital T, capital O, NATO. <clears throat> and underneath, in smaller letters, it said, stands for N, not A, uh, trustworthy T, organization, not a trustworthy organization. And there was a peace marcher beside me. And he said, I don't think he knew my name, but he said, you know what? You, you shouldn't be showing that sign. It's too extreme. <laughs> that, I, that, that, NATO, that, that just saying NATO is not a trustworthy organization was too extreme for a fellow peace marcher. So and anyway, I have more. I have more stories, but we're out of time. <laughs> well, we're gonna have to read your memoir when it when you're finished with it and it comes out. Barry, I love talking to you. We could do this for hours. We'll stick to the hour now, but we may get you back on the show. But thank you so much for coming on Nello and Freefall today. Thank you for having me, Andy. That's the standard thing. And thank you for running this show and running it well. And I've enjoyed what I've learned from you too. So we'll uh, say au revoir or something like that. <laughs>